With the final plans in hand, Mike and his team now face the daunting challenge of building the custom steel framework that will support the Calvert Island whale's bones high above the crowds. It's a real process of working with the bones because of course every single animal is different, like every person is different and so you have to kind of follow the bones. So you, you create pieces of steel work that, that fit around and fit in and cradle each, each bone. Somehow, he will pull together all of these hundreds of kilograms of metal and bone into a graceful rolling dive, finally piecing together the puzzle of this young humpback whale. Next on Whale Bones. At some point in the fall, most humpbacks stop gorging themselves on krill and fish and turn their thoughts towards travel. Here in British Columbia, they reorient themselves and begin a long southward migration to warmer waters. Most humpbacks return to the same winter breeding grounds year after year. Many of those who feed in British Columbia waters migrate to Hawaii or Mexico, while a few swim to Central America instead. These whales live off the energy they've stored in their fat since spring generally foregoing food in exchange for the opportunity to pass on their genes. Traveling thousands of kilometers to reach their wintering grounds, males will compete with each other for the chance to mate, and already pregnant females will give birth to a single four meter long, seven to 900 kilogram baby. Here, warmer temperatures mean the newborn calves don't have to be born with as much blubber as they would need in cold water feeding grounds but they do need to drink up massive amounts of energy from their mother's fatty milk to grow and quickly develop that thick layer of blubber that will sustain them and keep them warm on the migration back north in the spring. During those winter months, an adult humpback can lose more than a third of their body weight. So once newborn calves grow bigger, the seeds of the next generation have been planted and grumbling bellies become too hard to ignore, the humpbacks head back to their feeding grounds. Many find their way back to familiar spots, places with prey that can be reliably found year after year, and the whales get busy getting fat again. In the two or three trips the Calvert whale made up to the British Columbia coast, he flew under our radar. Despite enormous effort from whale researchers, no one ever spotted him along the course of his journeys, or at least no one ever caught his tail fluke on camera so that he could be identified, named, and added to our catalogs of known individuals. Which means we don't know his birth year, who his mother was, or where he was born and traveled back to in the winter. And if it weren't for the help of a small but tenacious hitchhiker, the mystery of where he came from and when would never have been solved. Humpback whales provide a home to a type of crustacean, distantly related to crabs and lobsters, called a barnacle. Barnacles are often spotted on rocks and piers of the world's shorelines, but there's one particular species that only spends its few short years on the planet nowhere else but riding on the head, flippers, tail, and other choice spots of humpback whales. From those plum locations, the filter-feeding barnacle, which can grow to be almost the size of a tennis ball, has easy access to its food of choice, plankton. The hard shell that surrounds and protects the soft-bodied critter inside is made of six calcareous plates that embed into a whale's skin. And every few weeks, the barnacle secretes new layers of calcite to cement its grip on its host. Because the barnacle pulls dissolved oxygen and minerals from the surrounding water to build these layers, and because the exact chemical composition of seawater differs from one place to the next, each little incremental ring of shell acts as a GPS pin of sorts recording the whale in their hitchhiker's movement from one part of the ocean to another. During the necropsy, several of these whale barnacles were cut away from the calvert humpback. As Mike preps the bones for hanging, folks at the Hakai Institute who are interested in learning more about the young whale's life drill samples from the barnacles and send them to a lab for processing. They're hoping to learn how long the whale had been in British Columbia waters before his death. And after months of waiting, the results come back. 
The particular barnacle they sampled contained clues from the last six months of the whale's life, and they revealed that the young humpback had likely just arrived in British Columbia, and he had traveled here from warmer waters. Whether he migrated from further south along the coast of the Americas, or from Hawaii across the Pacific, the young whale likely would have joined other males in the breeding grounds. But at only a year or two old, the Calvert humpback was not yet sexually mature, so he wouldn't have jockeyed for a chance to win the attention of females. It's possible, though, that he might have joined in the singing that humpback males are known for the world round. Why these whales sing is yet another unsolved mystery. Maybe the males are establishing territory, or trying to attract a mate, or to sort out dominance amongst themselves. Or maybe they're befriending and reconnecting with each other after a year spent apart. We don't know. We don't even know exactly how they make these haunting sounds without vocal cords. But what we do know is that while female humpbacks also vocalize, it's just the males who do the crooning, and they mainly sing in the winter breeding grounds. There they moan, squeal, trill, and gurgle the same complex medley again and again for hours at a time, slowly adopting small changes over the course of a season. Some consider this learned and shared community behavior to be an example of whale culture. Whatever the reason behind the warbling, the Calvert whale may have spent his last winter learning the newest variation of his neighbor's song and adding his own voice to the chorus. So I've been really fortunate to have worked on a big variety of different animals, like from the smallest marine mammal, the sea otters that have tons of tiny little intricate bones in their paws up to a couple of blue whale skeletons, which uh, things don't get any bigger than that. And like the challenge is how are you going to hold these massive bones up so they don't fall down on groups of school children? Um, lots of engineering and steel work. Back on Salt Spring Island, Mike and his team are hard at work building the metal framework that will hold the humpback's bones in place. That looks perfect. Awesome. So Katie's done a few whales with me already, but she is like just a fantastic metal worker. She can take straight pieces of stock and turn them into like whatever shape we need. The tricky part is to take the posture of the whale, the things that you want it to be doing when it's on display, and then curving all the bits of steel and, and making everything fit together so that it's holding every bone in the exact position that it should be inside the body, and then doing that movement that you're trying to display. So it's quite an organic process, you know, back and forth, using the actual bones, using the CAD model, and then hopefully it all fits in the lodge when you hang it up. But how do you take all those bits of bone and steel and turn them into something more, something that actually tells a story. So we actually have like several goals when we're building a skeleton display. And like I would say the first one, probably the simplest one, is to get the anatomy right. So we're you know representing the whale as you know as all these bones would be placed inside the flesh minus the flesh and just um, you know, if you get that part right, it usually looks pretty good because, you know, nature is an awesome designer. And then one of the most important parts of it is to use the animal in a way that will capture people's imagination and like draw them in and make them interested to learn more and this whole other story that can be opened up. My hope is that they're going to gain a greater appreciation for all of the life that we have in our oceans. Um, and really maybe connect with and start to understand um, some of the animals and struggles that they have and, and the threats that they're facing. And that's really what it's all about at the end of the day. Almost three and a half years after he washed up on shore on Calvert Island, this young humpback whale is almost ready for his final ocean voyage. Finished with the bone and frame assembly, Mike and his team carefully pack up the precious cargo, hand building a large crate that will carry these bones to the humpback's final home back on Calvert Island. On the last episode of Whale Bones. <laughs> <laughs>